Hey everyone, Nick Engvall here. Before we get into today's episode, I want to tell you about some of the people that make the sneaker history community and this podcast possible. It's more important than ever to think about who you give your money to when you're buying clothing to go with your kicks. Our friends at Guilty Goods started their brand with a goal of giving back, especially to the communities that make sneaker culture possible. With every purchase from Guilty Goods, at least 10% of the proceeds are donated to organizations like Big Brothers and Big Sisters, the Susan G. Komen Foundation, the Movement for Black Lives, and many more. You can save 30% on your order by using the code HISTORY at GuiltyGoods.us. Again, that's HISTORY at GuiltyGoods.us for 30% off, and you can feel good about your purchase knowing you're supporting a meaningful cause. Sneakers are all about presentation, and if you're like me, displaying your kicks at home or in the office is just as important as when they're on your feet. Sneaker Throne makes sneaker display cases featuring customizable LED lights, drop side cases to showcase the entire side of the shoe, not just the heel or the toe, the whole shoe. They've also got display cases for trading card collectors and hat collectors. To me, it's the perfect way to display your collection. You can save at least 10% on your Sneaker Throne order by using the code HISTORY at SneakerThrone.com. That's HISTORY at SneakerThrone.com. If you're a Patreon supporter or a member of our Discord community, you already know about Kicks with V Hot Sauce and his small batch locally sourced hot sauce. V has been one of the biggest supporters of sneaker history and the podcast since the early days. and He's currently the defending champion in our Community Trivia Nights competition. Kicks with V Hot Sauce has been a huge hit with the community. You can save 10% on your order by using the code SNEAKERHISTORY10 at kickswithvhots.com. That's SNEAKERHISTORY10 at kickswithvhots.com. Now, you're probably here because you like sneakers, and if you join the Discord, you know our community is about so much more than that. Whether it's the marathon-like community calls, trivia night debates, the in-person meetups, or just sharing our favorite experiences, we found that although we have such different backgrounds, we all have some unexpected shared passions. Not only does the entire community look out for each other when it comes to releases, we're like a support group for life in general. You can join the Discord community for free by heading to the show notes of this episode. After you're done listening to this episode, tell someone you like their kicks today. You never know how far a simple compliment can take you, and we all know how good it feels to have someone show their appreciation. Now let's get into today's episode. Jordan trying to shake off Starks. Oh, what a move! LeBron James with no record for human rights! No seconds. Against Gil, the crowd on its feet. Allen for the win! Welcome to the Sneaker History Podcast. How's everybody doing? Welcome to another episode of the Sneaker History Podcast. I'm Robbie. I'm chilling here with two fantastic individuals. One of them, my co-host, Rowett. And another one is the point legend, Mr. Terrence Watson. Man, I'm so happy to have you here. We're going to have a great episode talking about all things New York basketball, sneakers, just just a lot to cover. So we're very appreciative to have you here. How you doing, man? Yeah, I'm good. Uh, thank you guys for having me. I'm, I'm incredibly excited to be here. Um, it's my third time on the show. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to you guys for talking to me more than once. You know what I mean? I hope that people are entertained by this. No, I was going to say, like a great point guard, Terrence, the energy and the smile that you bring are infectious. And when you see a great point guard passing <laughs> and you want to get in on the act. So I selfishly, I've been fortunate enough to call you a friend in the dead stock world because every time I go to the shop, you're there and has managed to chop up about everything and anything. So it just makes sense, especially considering this passion project of yours that we definitely want to talk about today. But how are things? Are you currently in New York, right? Uh, I'm on the East Coast, yeah. You know what I'm saying? I came out here um, to go to the premiere, actually. Um, the premiere at this point, I think, was uh, like two weeks ago today, funny enough. Um, it was crazy, man. It was it was incredibly exciting. Um, you know, I got a chance to see a lot of familiar faces, like people I knew from the basketball community out here. Uh, I, I got a chance to I've, – I've met KD before, but – um, you know, kind of chop it up with him and, and, and uh, crack some jokes about some tweets. Uh, you know, I got a chance to meet Rich Kleiman and talk about talk about the film of him. Um, yeah, it was it was just incredible. Everybody that was in the film that could be there was there. Uh, you know, it was it, yeah, like I said, it was just a, a, a an incredible room to be in. Um, full of like basketball like legends and even people who aren't from New York. T Mac was there, Stack Jack was there. You know what I mean? Shout out Stack Jack. Um, so yeah, it was incredible. 
No, I was just going to say what was incredible was the reason why you were in New York. And what exactly was that reason, Terrence? Because there are some of us who are listening to sneaker history for the very first time, and they need to know about the awesomeness that you provide on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis. So what specifically was in New York? <laughs> well, yeah, you guys did an incredible job of setting that up. I like that. That was a, that was a beautiful lob. Um, well, yeah, like we're, we're talking today about uh, NYC Point God's um, which is a film executive produced by uh, Rich Kleinman, Kevin Durant, uh, Chike Kuti, um, I believe Mark Jackson, my man Samir Hernandez. Um, and it's basically about uh, like the, the point guards, right, from New York City that kind of set the table um, amongst you know, even the incredible amount of point guards that have come from this city, it felt like, you know, we established that in the eighties and nineties, there were a few who kind of raised the bar and took it on like a national scale to kind of like show that like, yo, if you want a point guard on your team, if you want to win, you know, you kind of got to come to New York to get that. Cause you know, we, we just play the position in a different way. Um, and just, just had a different energy and a different, different, style to it uh and so you know we the, the film was about highlighting that and you know showcasing that even the way the game's played today even the way the position is played today a lot of it stems from you know these guys and their peers um and and what they were able to do uh in terms of of, of reestablishing what the point guard position even looks like for the game no, and it's funny you mention that because before we get any further about what makes a great New York point guard, I happen to be friends with you. So I was looking at your Instagram and one of the most beautiful written things that you've ever written, and that's saying something because you have quite the portfolio, was this lack of a better term prologue that you put on your Instagram around that first New York point guard moment. And I was hoping you could kind of tell that story on camera so then people get an even better idea of what makes that New York point guard. Uh, yeah, sure. I could tell the story. Um, and you did the homework too. So that's a good question, bro. You know what I'm saying? Uh, well, yeah, I, when I shared the post, I was trying to think of like, all right, like you're either going to go real short caption, short and sweet, let the, let the, you know, trailer do all the talking, or I can like introduce it. You know what I mean? Like in a way that like makes, it made me feel like this is the story that like sets it up for my own personal journey as to like why I felt like I could help tell this story. Right. Like, um, you know, so basically uh, from Lower East Side, like I think a lot of people know uh, if you know me um, and I was playing for my neighborhood, uh, which is Smith Projects. Uh, and I don't even remember the team we were playing against. Uh, it's another another neighborhood team. Um, but we were in Smith, right. I'm like dead in the middle of Smith. Uh, there's a rec center and there's also a basketball court. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was pretty like packed out. It was a summer game. And I want to say I was probably like, had to have been like somewhere around 13 or 14, probably 14. Um, so I'm playing with, you know, like that age group somewhere, like, like I said, somewhere between 13, 14. Uh, and we're playing against, like I said, a neighboring team. And, you know, at that point I come down, uh, I had the ball and it's a tight game. It's the fourth quarter. Um, and I, I tried to make a pass and I turned it over. Right. Uh, other team calls timeout or something. And we go back into, you know, our huddle and my coach, like he didn't even draw up a play. He just cursed me the fuck out. Can I curse? I don't even. <laughs> you can't now. You can't. Can no. I, won't, I won't curse too much. You know what I mean? Out of respect for everybody. But like, yeah, he cursed me the fuck out. Um, his name was Craig Batchelor. That's my man. Shout out Craig Batchelor, one of my favorite coaches of all time. Um, but yeah, he did not draw up a play. He cursed me out and he was like, Terrence. You're not a point guard. Give up the ball. You're more of a slasher. Like, like for real, for real, went in on me on the sideline. And, like, I just took it. Like, you know what I mean? I wasn't – I didn't – I wasn't shaking. I wasn't rattled. I just was like, all right, like, he's yelling at me. It's like that's what coaches do, right? So the next play, the team comes down. We get a stop, right? And so, again, I think we were – if I'm not mistaken, I think we were down one or down two. But we were down. Uh, again, at home, you know, playing outdoors outside of our rec center. Um, so, yeah, I come down. Uh, I get the ball. I get the ball, like, maybe, like, on the right wing. 
right? And our best player, I kind of saw him opposite me. So I tried to draw the defense out so to create a little space for him. So I kind of like dribbled like like a tag dribble kind of like towards say like the the right elbow to kind of like engage my defender and like I pulled him out just enough to like create space for uh, his name was Dooley. Dooley kind of like was able to like like kind of roll to the basket and like just as Dooley's like like right as it was like super tight window too. Just as Dooley like kind of cuts from like top of the key, I dribbled like through my left leg and did like a like a drop pass to Dooley, uh, like like a no look drop pass at that. Oh, like you know what I mean? Like oh, similar to, to Dooley, Derek Rose you know I mean? with Yo Kim Noah against the Washington Wizards way back when, where they were trailing break and he just put it between the legs. I know exactly what you're talking about. It was it was something like that. Like, but it was more like like I'm visualizing it now. Like it was kind of like I dribbled left. I kind of no looked it and kind of like almost like turned to the crowd too, which was a home crowd. And Dooley being like the best player, he was like the real, real scorer on that team. Finished it, you know what I'm saying? Got like uh got the got the N one, made the free throw, and then the other team called another timeout. So we're going back, and again, I'm not thinking about what just happened. My coach cursed me out, nothing like that. But he grabbed me and he was like, Yo, turns. That's why I fucking love you. I just cursed you to fuck out. Told you you're not a point guard. Or you make a play like that. Like, that, you. that's why I fucking love you. <laughs> like, and I was just like, in that moment, like, I was like, all right, cool. Like, I guess I can play point now. Like, you know what I mean? Like, he let me rock. And then even, too, like, I, you know what? Now that I think about it, I don't think I included this in the story. After that, he had me play up, like, with the, like, 16s and 17s playing point. You know what I mean? Like, at West 4th Street. Um Cause I was we, I was playing my age group at West Forth, but then after that he took me and like a, a couple of the other like really good guys um, that were our age group and had us play like up against like the 16, 17 year olds, I think, and and maybe even yeah like 17, 18 year olds. Like he had us playing against like the high school division is what I'm trying to say, and uh, I think he forever. probably wouldn't have if I wouldn't have made that pass. <laughs> that'll forever remind me so, of so another not not a New York point God. But just a New York player, Ron Artest, being told by Phil Jackson to not shoot the three at the time. Don't shoot, don't shoot. And I looked over at Phil and I shot it anyway. That's you looking at the crowd. Make the pass anyway. <laughs> it's it is New York, it's lineage. I don't know. Gotta... Yeah. You're told not to do it. Like, well, I'm just told not to. I have to do it now and succeed. Right. That's what rocks, though, and succeed. Yeah. You're gonna, listen, if, you're gonna, if you're going to be confident like that, and you're going to go against what the coach just fucking said, you, you better make the play or else you not only are you not playing the rest of that game, you're probably not getting the call back the game after. Like, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, pressure bust pipes, man, or it makes diamonds. You yep. know what I mean? So I now, I'm just going to say that is the quintessential New York point guard because you had the quicksand to forget about what just happened. You had the Teflon demeanor to just rise above it. And then most importantly, you were a showman. And whenever I think of New York, I think of the bright lights. I think of the flashy play. And that's what you did when the matter, when it mattered most. So talk to me now about the fact that if you had to kind of boil down a great New York point guard, is it something as simple as, oh yeah, X amount of charisma, X amount of skill. But what else is there? Because I think for us, whenever we think about New York point guard, the first thing that comes to my mind is a handle. Is that fair to say? Or is there some other skill that you would prioritize yeah. first when you're building that New York point guard? I mean, I think that uh, in the film, like we do, I think there's a coach Niclario, uh For those who don't know, coach Ron Niclario is like, if I'm not mistaken, the winningest coach in PSAL history, which is like the public school league in New York City. He coaches at Cardoza, Cardoza High School in Queens. Um, and he does an incredible job of establishing exactly what you're talking about. So, like, there's three things that, you know, make up a New York point guard, right? And that's, like, uh, toughness, handles, and showmanship. Um, you know, you, you got to have toughness uh, because it's just the way you were raised, right? Like, you can't be afraid of the moment. You can't be afraid of another player, can't be afraid of your coach when he's cursing you on the sideline. Like you just got to take it and you got to grow and, and go through it. Um, you got to have uh, handles. It's just kind of the way we're raised. You know what I mean? Like I, I remember 
wow, you just made me think of the very person who helped me learn how to dribble behind my back and what it was. And it was a kid named Albert who was a little bit older than me. And he had a pretty tight handle. Uh, but he had, he told me sit on like the lip of a chair and kind of just dribble behind, behind your like legs while you're sitting on a chair. And like, he taught me like different drills to do with that. Uh, and what's funny about that is like, you know, the New York city point guard lineage, right. I literally taught my nephew that like two weekends ago, you know what I'm saying? Like just, we just pass it down. Um, and then there's the showmanship, like, you know what I'm saying? I think every, every borough has its own version. Um, you know, like they say in the film, like Harlem guys are a little, probably the most flashy, but in my opinion, the best passer of the point gods, uh, and it's probably not really close is Mark Jackson. And he's not from Harlem. Right. And I mean, like he, he, we all watched him, you know what I'm saying? He did the shimmy before Antoine, <laughs> like, you know, he was having fun out there, but he, it's, it's a little bit of like, just like you said, bro, like that's what New York's about. Like you got to do something to stand out. And you got to do something to show that you have that level of confidence. So if I make a cool pass, yeah, I'm going to look to the crowd and like wink at somebody. Like, you know what I mean? Like if I, if I cross somebody, like, you know, like I'm a, I'm a definitely dance a little bit. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like on my way to the rim, like, you are know you not like, entertained? Have fun. Exactly. It's gladiator yeah. school and you're going to be entertained. No, and the project that we are promoting on this podcast is the New York City Point Guards. It is available on Sh uh, Showtime. It's on Hulu now, so that's a plus for me because your boy didn't get the Showtime log on because I don't have the Point Guards in my life to make that key pass. But what I wanted to ask you next, Terrence, is a two-part question. One is, how did you get involved with this documentary? Because on the surface, knowing you a little bit, this almost feels like it's tailor-made for you. And then talk to me about the fact that I don't want to say this feels like a culmination, but this truly feels like you are at the apex of your powers. How, how are you in the moment? Because right now, I imagine you're creatively as in the zone as some be can be, because this is truly a love letter to one of those things in life that I know you truly love and cherish. Um, well, to answer your first question, man, uh, to be honest, I, I, I was brought on um, by Chike and Kuti, uh, specifically Chike. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to know them for quite some time and be friends with them um, really through basketball. I met I met them at a basketball event where I was playing and I was crossing dudes up. You know what I'm saying? Chica, Chica got a little bit of that. <laughs> I was just playing. Uh, but yeah, I really got to know them then and um, just been tight with them ever since. And anyway, I, I, was, uh, I was wrapping up one production um, and Chica called me and it was like dumb late and like, like lately. And I looked at my phone and I was like, Chike doesn't call me. Like, and he wouldn't call me this late. And I was just like, all right, like, I need to answer this. So I answered the phone and like, he basically just kind of dove right in and started explaining what the project was about. And he was like, oh, they're looking for a, a, they're looking for a writer, but I want you to do it. You know what I mean? And then he was like, what's up? Like, can you do it? And I was like, for one, I was like, uh, yes. <laughs> like I, I took no time to figure it out. Um, and yeah, like, I mean, I, I, I'm gonna transparently say like I was on vacation, like it was like my second day and I've been trying to be better about honoring things for myself. I also was out of the country with like spotty Wi-Fi, So I was like, look, I'm a thousand percent down. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna dedicate myself to you. You know me. So I'm with, I'm with it, but I got to finish out my vacation so that I could come back like ready, prepared and sharp. And, you know, he honored that he introduced me to the team, um, you know, uh, the lead producer, my man, Billy Burke, um, and my man, Sam Sneed, uh, who's the director. Uh, I think they were a little bit nervous cause they were on a, a deadline that was not flexible. Um, you yeah. know what I mean? So like they, you know, how most projects are. So me being on vacation didn't really, it didn't ease anybody's like, you know, worries at first, but you know, we were able to get through it. Uh, like I said, as soon as I got home, I got busy. Uh, so, you know, um, you know, yeah, we made it happen. Um, can you remind me of a second question? Bro? Yeah, just My around bad. the fact that this seems like a apex moment for you. Because what I noticed oh. that was prevalent in the movie was just the fact that I've known some of your history. I've known some of the very cool things that you've done. But this almost feels like a magnum opus, lack of a better term. And maybe I'm quick to be very hyperbolic about this. But I think this is as fantastic of a work as I've ever seen. So... 
how did what you've done in the past shape what you did with this? Because I truly feel this is a combination of your powers. Um, I, I mean, I hope it's not. I don't want to peak right now, but I That's know what fair. you mean, so I respect it. <laughs> nah, but <laughs> yes. Um. Well, yeah. Also, let me just like make it clear, like what I was able to actually affect. So, when Chike called me, he let me know that they had actually already shot it. So the interviews were done. Um, it was mostly, they were in like crunch time of editing. Like I, I, I'll say they were like 80% there, but what Chike needed me for, uh, and, and what they asked me to be a part of was actually stringing the story together. Cause it wasn't really a story. It was like, now I saw it and I thought it was beautiful. And like, honestly, even if they would have just put it out as is, I would have watched it, but I'm like a, a Hooper head. Like I'd love basketball. So I still would have just been like, no, this is amazing. You know what I mean? And I appreciate that they they saw it from, like, a storytelling aspect that, like, no, wait, we need a story to connect it. Um, so that's what I was able to do. Like, I came in and, like, uh, Joe Kenneth, who was the narrator, he's a poet. He's a spoken word poet. Incredible job. Um, his part was actually already attached to it as well. The, the opening poem that you guys see in the trailer and in the beginning of the film. And so seeing even seeing that gave me like one mad energy but two i got a sense of how he delivers things so i was like okay cool like that's awesome because i can like write to like his beats you know what i mean like i can write to like where i feel like he'll he'll deliver his inflections and like you know he and he caught it him and i never even spoke and he caught it like that's that's what kind of chemistry we had as a team you know what i'm saying and and, and it was it was you know we everything after that like there's a scene that begins with like, you know, the New York City skyline and then um, what we call Crackers Whack Park uptown. Um, and as a kid, like dribbling there. And uh, from that point on, like I pretty much wrote, you know, everything. I think there were a few things I edited, um, you know, as, as they went on. But like, yeah, like that was where I was able to like impart. But to answer your question, Ro, honestly, like I hadn't really started writing scripts until literally the week of the pandemic. That's a whole nother story, but like, <laughs> it's only crazy. we had a podcast. I don't know if. Huh? No, I was just joking around. I'm what sorry for derailing you. No, I was just saying, if only we had a podcast no, to get into that long me. story. <laughs> Listen, I'm trying to stay on topic, bro. But point is, I was, I was, I don't know what my, like, whether like the NDA has expired. So I won't say who it was for, but uh, Camp Grizzly brought me on to write a script for. Someone that is very musically inclined that we all know. I'll say it like that, right? Okay. And uh, <laughs> that was also doing something with basketball. And um, they were like, same kind of deal, actually. Like, they they were like, yo, you have, we'll be generous and say 10 days, but really it's like seven. And can you get it done? And it's crazy, too, because, like, as it was, as I was working on that, like, news that you know the pandemic was happening here in america just started trickling in so i'm writing this thing and then like you know every email just looks more like grim <laughs> like hey we want to get this check in but also we don't know if this thing is even going to see the light of day so but you know it was beautiful and it gave me a lot of confidence to know that like yeah to your point like i've, I've written a lot of things um and and, and especially up until that point <clears throat> excuse me with mad confidence and knowing that I could do it, but, you know, I was put in a position where it was like, all right, you either got to sink or swim, bro. Like you write a script for this legend. You know what I mean? Like do it. Like, don't, don't worry about it. Do it. Like you're the writer. Like that's literally what I had to say in my head to myself is that if you don't do it, somebody on that team is going to do it. And it's probably not going to be as good as what you would have done. So just do it, you know? Um, and yeah, it, it gave me the confidence that I needed to be able to like even step into this. And like since then, I've I've only gotten better at script writing and understanding like what what a really good script needs. Um, and I think too, like I just want to call back like the start of like my career in terms of like like within New York City was from uh, a magazine called Bounce Magazine, uh, and it was uh, founded by. Uh, Bobito Garcia, you know, uh, AKA Cool Bob Love, my mentor, my friend, um, Sean Couch. DJ Cooper Slice. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. He got mad names. Uh, Sean yes. Couch, 
uh, Jesse Washington, uh, and my man, uh, Justin Leonard was, uh, one of the, um, I want to say, I hope I don't misspeak. I don't think it was, he was a producer, but, um, publisher, there you go. Um, and anyway, uh, you know, uh, Bobito gave me a shot, uh, after reading a story that I wrote about my cousin who now is a DJ, um, in the, in the city. And he pretty much DJs like all the big tournaments, uh, alongside, uh, one of the best people to ever really, um, you know, MC a, a basketball game, my man, Joe Pope. Um, and I did that because my brother was friends with a guy named, uh, Randy Watson, who's another friend of mine. Now, Randy was already writing about Brooklyn for bounce. Like, so to give you like a little bit more context, bounce magazine was about playground basketball. So if you had a legend in your neighborhood, or if we talked to an NBA player, we talked to them about like, the, the court that they grew up on that they cut their teeth on, you know what I mean? Like most of it was centered around like, you know, street ball and like not even just street ball in the sense of, like, and one, but like neighborhood basketball and the community that it builds and like the players that it fosters. Um, and so, you know, that is where I start. And that's where people in New York city, like if they didn't know me from playing at first, they knew me from that too. You know what I mean? Like, so like, that's where, like I really like was able to kind of like impart, you know, relationships, um, you know, and, and get to know players who maybe I didn't know or didn't grow up with or who were a little bit older than me or what have you, um, you know, get to know like a lot of the directors if I didn't play in their tournaments growing up, um, you know. And so even then I felt qualified because I'm like, no, I'm a player. Like, you know, what I mean, who's a really who just happens to be a really good writer. And I think eventually, like, you know, that was what I kind of built my name around is like, now everybody like trusted me to tell the story because I'd also be in the gym with them. Like, you know what I mean? Like I would come to the workouts and work out. Yep. I come to the, to the run and like play, you know what I mean? I wasn't getting 30. Like, let me be clear. Like I'm playing, <laughs> I'm talking about like guys who was like really playing overseas and stuff, but like, I wasn't asked, like, you know what I'm saying? Like I wasn't like, no, you know, not at all. So I figured like, you nah, would get... like, we respect your opinion. I just figured you'd what be I was figuring you'd get the quintessential New York point guard line of 15 points, 12 assists, eight boards, and four steals, and one wink at your girl when nobody else is looking. But the thing that I thought <laughs> you know was – Let's go with that. Why not? Let's, yeah, let's, why not? Let's go with We're that. here We're to like, dig yeah, you up. You know what I'm saying? Like, Absolutely. <laughs> and once again, nah, project but, um, is New York City point guards. Point guards. You gotta, point you gotta guards. Put See, the, look at that. Uh, the, that was a blasphemous yeah. slip on my part. But needless to say, we move on. <laughs> Yo, nah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, like, to be honest, it was kind of like, I know that the term kind of may feel full circle, but I just, I, I I do hope that I can do even more, you know what I mean, like from this, but it, it definitely was a moment of like, wow, like, you know, looking back and like knowing that I started there and then, um, you know, two, three years ago, uh, whenever the pandemic started, I, I think we've all been like a, this is like, <laughs> day 977 of the pandemic or whatever but um you know even going to that moment to now realizing like wow everything really has helped me get here understanding like you know how to edit how to write a script how to you know like like and and good on you know like i said billy um uh and sam because they worked on this for two years um, and you guys know, like, if you work on something that long, you're sometimes you're blinded by it, but it is your baby. So to bring someone else in and trust that they also know something that could be helpful, man, like that's tough. And I told them that like, after the fact, well, like, I, I appreciate that they genuinely trusted me to come in and like impart some things. Cause like where I could affect even outside of the script, like I, I, I tried my best to do that. Um, and again, I don't know that I would have been ready for that three years ago, um, before I wrote my first script or like now that I've had time to continuously do that, you know, and, and be a part of like, you know, really, really editing things. And so like, yeah, it just very much felt like, you know, I know there's a lot of like biblical themes, but it definitely felt like God's timing. You know what I mean? Like I'm now ready to actually do this very important thing that has made the basketball community at large and the one that I come from feel very good. Uh, and so like, I, 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 you know, and I said this to like every player I could that night. Um, and I mean it wholeheartedly. Uh, 
I'm just very honored to use the skills that I have to honor them with the skills that they imparted on the game. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, just incredible. Yeah, and there's a lot to process with what you said because so much of point guard plays trust. It's trusting your guys are in the right position, and then it's also a trust in your own ability to get them the ball in that sweet spot. Because ultimately, if you do your job better than anybody else, everyone else's life is so much easier. So once again, thank you to Coach Craig Bachelor for instilling that in less from a very young age, because this is truly a testament to his great coaching. I wanted to use this opportunity now because we've kind of flirted around this idea of some of the players that were mentioned in the documentary. Do you want to maybe talk about about how you would build your ideal New York point guard, utilizing people that were in the movie, as well as some local legends that maybe the likes of me growing up in rural Missouri never got to truly appreciate. Wow. Uh, thank you. Um, cause now I can't share this. Cause if I don't say someone, everybody's going to be like, Oh, word, you didn't say this person. Yeah. And, and if you have a problem, <laughs> I got you, Terrence, I got you. If you have a problem with all of this, please add us at R A H B E E seven Oh two, because he will take all those complaints head on and he will respond to every not, single one of them. Gonna person. To you. No, they're, they're not, not. going to listen to you. I promise you they will yell at me and curse me out as if I did something wrong, but nah. Um, to be real, okay, so from the from the players from the film, I think I would take uh I would take I mean honestly like Steph's profile and athleticism. You know what I mean? Uh yeah. maybe his overall ability to and just enhance it with the other guys. Um meaning like I, I do think Mark had a slightly better passing ability. So I'd probably add Mark's passing ability. Um, I guess, you know, you can decide who had better handles. Um, but okay, Sham God's handles and Skip's showmanship. I'll say it like that. Uh, I think that there's, there's something beautiful about that kind of like mix. Um, I like Pearl's charisma. You know what I mean? Like you gotta have a little bit of that, and like the 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 chutzpah <laughs> to like look at the greatest defense in the history of college basketball and be like, yeah, cool, that's nice. You can't check me. Um, I think I would take. I mean, Rod's finishing ability around the rim is still probably it would check out today. Like you know what I mean? Like he could be that person today, and it would be incredible. Um. I don't I don't think I left anyone out. No, you uh, you answered that question beautifully. Yeah. Because but the, I'm but, literally going through the checklist. Yeah, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, if somebody yells at you for that, maybe Sebastian Telfair, but come on. Like Seb, I feel is that next tier. So with what feels like a commonality between all these New York point guards is not only the fact that they're putting on for the city, but they're helping rear that next generation. So similar to how I believe your friend Albert taught you how to dribble the basketball that you passed on to your nephew, if I remember correctly, like there is mm -hmm. that component to it. So I would say Sebastian Telfair is the next one up that is grooming from your ideal point guard. Oh, for sure. I mean, Bassie, I got a chance to play against Bassie when we were kids. Uh, or teenagers or what have you. I mean, he for one, as good as advertised, number one. Um, yeah. For two, uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think that, you know, they did an incredible job of framing it between 80s and 90s because even within that, you could talk about so many more point guards, right? Like, we know that. Um, but if you, but if you, you know, if you go beyond that, you know, I think that they – I also think they did a good job of like incorporating uh, the, the players that we called, you know, here, the three headed monster in Talib Brown, Omar Cook uh, and Andre Barrett. Cause I don't, if I'm not mistaken, there hasn't been three McDonald's all Americans from New York city in one class since them. Uh, and they were phenomenal. Right. You know, like I, I loved watching those guys. Actually, I had met Talib before. Um, I, I, I don't know Dre like that, like that, but we met a bunch of times and like, you know, you know, it's like a, Hey, when I see him, um, but Omar of the three was my favorite. Uh, Cause I saw him play at St. John's and in my first time at that event, telling him that, that like, dude, like no lie. I saw you when I was like in middle school and it was the first time that I like you, you were my first college basketball game. 
And because I was on a team, like, you know, it was one of those, like, you know, how they, they give like teams like really nice seats and stuff like that. Sometimes they gave us like floor seats, which I was not expecting. Right. It was crazy. I mean, I know it's a college game, but I'm at the garden and I'm like 13 or something like that. And, and I'm watching Omar cook get busy. Like he was directing everything. He was that guy. And like, he was my favorite player at the time. You know what I mean? Like that team was really good. That St. John's team. But I mean, yeah, he was just, phenomenal and I was just like watching everything he did it was one of those like you know how sometimes you get like that point where you're not even watching the game you're just watching one person I think that like for most of the game that's what it was I was just watching him and so you know I, I even had to thank him and tell him like dude like you were an inspiration like you were one of the people who made me want to continue to try you like you know what I mean um but there is one other in my opinion point guard that I got a shout out and that's like uh, my brother, Brian Gardner hire, like you said, like who are the people that like no one else would really know pros know him. Everybody in the city knows him. He has a tournament in my neighborhood called uh, LES express. Um, in my opinion is, is this generation's West fourth street, no disrespect to West fourth. It is hollow ground. But I think like, you know, for the, for the what's coming up next, you know, in lower Manhattan, uh, you know what I'm saying? And I, I'll be honest, I've seen Brian go against, in his prime, you know, against pros. And, you know, I tell people all the time, he, he, he's shorter. He may be like five, eight, five, five, eight, let's call it that. But he was a mm-hmm. tiger. Like he was vicious. And like, even his handle was just like, so quick and aggressive. You, you really couldn't touch him. Like I've never seen anybody steal the ball from him. And again, I've seen him play on every level. I've never seen anyone steal the ball from him. I've only seen him maybe turn it over like anyone would. Like, you know what I mean? But even then, like, that's not – I can count on one hand. You know what I'm saying? Like, I've never seen anybody steal the ball from him. And I've seen him embarrass people. Like, we're from the same neighborhood. Literally, I've we've had to leave because Brian, like, shook people so bad that, you know, we're in another neighborhood and they were, like, not feeling it. <laughs> like, like I've, that's real stories. Like, I've seen Brian. Like, I knew I could play when I got on the court and had to guard him and, like, he shook me, but it was like kind of like there's a point when Kenny says in the film, oh, I know I knew I had the confidence to go play against Michael Jordan because before seeing Michael Jordan, he was like, there's no way he's as good as Pro Washington. No way. Obviously, he found out that he was clearly better than Pro Washington, but that's how I felt guarding Brian. When I played against him, I was like, I can guard anyone, even though Brian was like mostly sh- shaking me too. I still had the – it was like a – he was preparing me like you know what i mean like if i could guard you i know i can guard kids my age like because brian's also like four years older than me i think so that gave me like a sense of like yeah no like if i if, if i'm not like getting shook and shaken up every play you know what i mean like i can somewhat stay in front of you yeah i can there's no other 16 year old that's gonna like destroy me so yeah it's kind of like that lineage like you were talking about man we pass it down here no, but I, there is a sense of a gatekeeper ownership of it because it can't be given to everybody. Like there has to be that New York ability to earn it because if there's one thing that's New York, mm-hmm. it's that gritty blue collar mentality, regardless if you're in Manhattan or the Bronx or Staten Island. One thing I wanted to kind of touch on because you've briefly mentioned it a couple of times and I figured if we are talking about in that basketball parlance, let me just give you an ISO for three minutes because you've mentioned a name, Pearl Washington, that hoop heads know, but use this as a pulpit to inform the masses about the brilliance of one Pearl Washington. Washington, if you could, and take as long um, as you need. Yeah, I mean, you know, RIP to the legend. He's from Brownsville, Brooklyn. Uh, I got family from out there. Um, the the thing about Pearl that I wanted to share on this too was like he kind of had like an early version of what we call NIL deals, only he wasn't getting paid. Um, but the the short skinny story of it is like Pearl was so good that while he was at Syracuse. Uh, which was a Nike team, right? Like Nike was paying Jim Beheim, um, outfitting the team. He was wearing pro keds and he had been wearing pro keds since like he was like a junior or senior in high school. Um, kind of with the idea that like, because he's this legend already, you know, like the, the, at the time, I guess, whoever was like, you know, um, the representative for pro keds was like, look, like we know you're going to the league. So we'll give you a deal. You know what I mean? Like, we'll, I will outfit you 
with like the understanding that we'll give you like a big check once you actually make the league. Cause obviously at the time, like you, you really couldn't do that. Um, and apparently Jim Beheim let him like, that's how good he was. You know what I mean? Like Jim Beheim was like, all right, cool. Like you go wear pro cast. I think up until like, maybe like the, if I'm not mistaken, uh, his senior year is when he started wearing Nike dunks, like in the, in the, in like the tournament, you know what I mean? Like I think the Big East tournament or something like that, but like for the most of the season, you know, he would just wear pro cast, which is kind of amazing when you think about like, it was the eighties, like, you know what I mean? And he like was so good that he had, you know, a coach like Jim Bay, <laughs> just let him rock. Um, and because it's a sneaker history, I wanted to drop a little sneaker history. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like I wanted to impart a little sneaker knowledge um, for those listening so that I, I know those listening also love basketball, but it is sneaker history. So I wanted to like, you know what I mean? Stay, stay true to the pod and, and drop a gem. That is why you are the point God, Terrence Watson. Uh, Terrence, before we go, I just wanted to broach that subject a little bit more in depth, which is around the concept of who's next. You had mentioned a beautiful name from the past, but you and I also briefly chatted about the fact that would we see a great New York City point guard, let's say, come from the quote unquote right side of tracks? Because there's this weird kind of unique narrative that all these New York City point guards had to kind of go through some sort of struggle, which I agree. Every single one of us on this earth go through some sort of struggle. But do you ever see a scenario where you would see somebody that may not have the same degree of struggle also take it to the streets in the sense of providing that toughness, having that handle and that showmanship that may have come from a different part of the town? Um, I mean, here's the thing. Like, there are some guys right now carrying the mantle in terms of like being great point guards from New York city um, who are in the league, who who play overseas, who, who play in the tournaments. Right. Um, but I think to answer your question, like that era, it's not that it's gone. You know what I mean? Guys, guys will come and play in tournaments outside and you know, we, 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 that's a part of our culture, you know what I mean? So like, you know, just this past week, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you know, Pelicans guard Jose Alvarado, you know, who's from Brooklyn, he made sure to come home and like, you know, play, right? Like he played in our pro city. He played at Dykeman. Um, I'm not sure if he played anywhere else. And if he did, you know, my bad guys for not mentioning it. But, you know, our our players, it does mean a lot. Even if you are an NBA player, a lot of times they will come come out, you know, because it's for the community, right? Um, and even if you're not, you know what I mean? Like we got Isaiah Washington, AKA Jelly Fam, you know, he had that incredible, phenomenal wave, right? Like, uh, which was, it was lightning in a bottle, right? Like you couldn't really, you can't, you can't recreate that. And and I think that that's like something that really is a testament to like the creativity of a New York guard. You know what I mean? Like just reinventing the game in another way, like, you know, bringing something new, like putting a spin on something that's, you know, no pun intended, something that's a little bit like, you know, old or classic, you know what I'm saying? Like, how do we give it new life? And I think that that's also a big testament um, to who we are. Um, but to your other point about like, you know, they, yeah, like the city itself is going to make you tough. I, I don't care what part you come from. I don't care even if you're from like outer boroughs, you know, like a Yonkers or, you know, Long Island, whatever. Like, you know what I mean? Like you're, you're, you're in the city. It's, it's it is what it is. That's, that's how we're, that's how we're, we're born. You know what I'm saying? Like that's, that's what the city will make you do. But, um, I, I do think that every era just has its own, its own day and its own style. And like, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know that it's necessarily like, okay, you have to go play outside every day to now be this, this thing. Cause a lot of the, to be honest, like, you know, I see kids now in eighth grade that can do things that college kids were doing when I was a kid, you know what I'm saying? Like the game just evolves and, you know, players get better, but I do think that, and and this is in the film too, you know, I hope hope I haven't given them too much of the film, but you know, one of the, one of the points of showing like how each point guard uh, played a role in evolving the position itself is, is the very fact of like, yeah, like, At the time, it was innovative because you could identify a point guard from New York based on the style of play. But you can't really do that anymore because the style of play that New York has brought to the position has just become baseline for how you play the position. 
if I was to say like, oh, like toughness, showmanship, handles, I could watch, you know, a YouTube clip of a kid right now from Arkansas. And he probably dribbles and plays and is heady, you know, the way a point guard would have been 10, 15, 20 years ago. And you would have been like, oh, what part of New York is he from? And that's not not to say that you can't still do that with New York guards. But it is to say that, like, yeah, the position itself has just become, you know, uh, you know, infused with so much of what what New York guards, you know, brought to the game. And so, you know, while, yeah, like, you know, I still think that, like, we we do, you know, produce the best point guards. I still stand on that. Um, there's a stat, too, like, in case anybody has anything to say about that. This last NCAA tournament, more players were from New York than any other state. You know what I'm saying? So everybody put some respect on it and remember that. We still we still out here. Uh, but I do think that the position itself has been affected globally, right? Like you look at you look at almost any point guard, the way they play, the way they dribble, the way they finish around the rim, you know, it that's that's what we brought to the game. That's what these guys who we're highlighting brought to the game. And so, you know, the position itself, um, you know, like I said, it, it just has while while this I still stamp that New York produces the best players in that position to play it, you know, you have lineage from these guys, whether you know it or not. And I think that that was one of the key parts of the doc is to make sure that everybody knows. No, and I think the doc, New York City Point Gods, available on Showtime and Hulu, does a fantastic job of that. And as you were chatting, something popped up in my mind in terms of that question around who's next. I think who's next, ironically, is somebody who's in New York. But And correct me if I'm wrong, because I've never lived in New York. That is you. That is your home. New York always felt like a melting pot or a city of transplants. And I think right now, probably the best New York point guard from a geographical perspective is not the one at the New York Knicks or the Nets, but at the New York Liberty. And I think Sabrina Ionescu is going to influence these kids and bring something to a table that they previously may not have seen. Because I also think we're in that golden age of watching female basketball and no longer relegating it to a joke. So I completely buy what you're saying. And here's hoping that we continue to find beauty in unlikely sources because because if Sabrina Ionescu can impact a kid in the Bronx and hold him or her to a new level of accountability in terms of protecting that rock so that way they get spoken about like your friend does, where people are recounting on one hand the amount of times they've seen the ball turn over, that's the beauty of the point guard. That's the beauty of the game. That's the beauty of New York City being the focal point. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for allowing us to kind of go down this path. And let's just use this last 30 seconds. Plug yourself one more time, Terrence, because I think everybody would love to follow you if they don't already. And where can they find you? Um, real quick, I want to try, chime in on what you just said. Yeah. I got a chance yeah, to go to uh, the, the Liberty game. They had a back-to-back versus the Sparks, and I went to the first game. Um, and, you know, you're very right. Like, Sabrina, I think she's going to, like, be one of the one of the people who, who carries that torch of being an incredible point guard. I think she just put up uh, – I hope I don't butcher the stat, but if I'm not mistaken, she put up, like, 500 points, 200 assists, and 100 steals or something like that. Or, or maybe 100 rebounds. I'm not sure. I don't remember what the 100 was, so my bad. But um, she's like the second player, I think, in the history of the league to do that. Um, and, I mean, she's only going to get better, you know. And I think, like, to, to the point of what you're saying, yeah, maybe she's not from New York, but she embodies it. You know why? Because I think in her, her first season, people were writing her off. People were saying, like, oh, she's not that good. Oh, she was overhyped. And look at her. She's cooking. You know what I mean? Like she's leading her team to a to a, a, a playoff run potentially. Like you know what I mean? I don't think they they've officially made it just yet. But that's my point. You know, that's your point. She's embodying that. So you can that's <laughs> that's what it is to be a new a player in New York, right? You're either from it and you get it and you're raised by it, or you're good enough to go there and handle the pressure. You know what I'm saying? And and be cultivated and be embraced by the city because you you embody like what the city's about. So yeah, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Sabrina's Sabrina's a mamba, you know what I mean? And, and mambas don't fold, they attack. That's exactly it. And with that, um, Terrence, one more time, where can they find you? Yeah. Uh, for one, thank you guys for having me, man. This is incredible. Oh, I appreciate it so much. I really genuinely do. Um, go watch uh, NYC Point Gods 
on Hulu, on Showtime. Um, and if you want to follow me, uh, you can follow me on social uh, social media, on Twitter or Instagram at Lower East Scribe. Uh, again, that's uh, Lower East Scribe uh, on pretty much any platform. You can follow me there. Excellent. And you can follow us at Sneaker History on all the socials as well. You can follow my temporary co-host, Robbie Falchi at R-A-H-B-E-E-702. You can follow me at RoadM13 on Instagram, at Rohizi on Twitter. Terrence, thank you for one of the most pleasant and easy to do interviews. I wish you nothing but the best in your further career. And apologies for saying this is a culmination. This is a temporary culmination. You're going to kill it and you're going to continue to kill it. So thank you for your time. No, no, nah, man, you don't got to apologize, man. I know what you meant. I appreciate it. Yeah, like, I think it's a big moment. I'm going to enjoy it. Thank you. And also, let me just say, whoever watches this, um, thank you, because I've, I've gotten incredible support. You guys, you know what I mean? Like, it's just been crazy. Like, and, I, and it really feels like I did something or was a part of something, excuse me, to, like, make the city proud. And, you know, I, I, I it's hard for me to put into words just how, uh, incredible a feeling that is, you know, I said to my mom and I'll, I'll leave on this note. It feels like as if I was from New York, right. But was good enough to get drafted by the Knicks and then bring home a championship. Like that's what this feels like everywhere I've gone. Everyone's been like, yo, big enough and, and been happy about like what we, what, what we were able to do. Um, and it was a real team effort by ev- and everyone too. If, if, I don't know if you noticed this, but another little fun fact, Easter egg, everyone involved, particularly on camera but even like a lot of the people involved anyway are are new yorkers but everybody that was on camera is a new yorker um you know what i mean so it was a real team effort and it was really like a love letter like you said um from us to the to the game and to the city we love excellent and with that we will see you guys next time thank you everyone peace Hey everyone, this is Nick again. Before you take off, do us a solid and head over to Apple Podcasts to leave us a review. Give us a rating on Spotify and Amazon Music, and make sure you're subscribed to our YouTube channel because we have even more video content coming soon. Speaking of new content, we have an amazing community of sneaker enthusiasts that hang out in our Sneaker History Discord on a daily basis. While sneakers is a connection point that brought us all together, we've all discovered countless shared passions that we have in common with each other. We recently launched a couple of new podcasts directly from our community. One of them is a Formula One podcast. If you're an F1 fan like me, the Exhaust Notes podcast is your weekly fix of Formula One fun. It's hosted by myself, Rohit Malhotra, and Todd Yates. New episodes drop every Tuesday. I've been wearing fitted hats for years and collecting my favorite teams since I was a little leaguer. It has been awesome to see so many new fans getting into fitteds in recent years. Crown and Stitch is our new talk show about fitted hats with Dexter, Keith, and myself, where we talk about fitted hats, snapbacks, throw in some obscure hats because we all kind of like some funky stuff once in a while, don't we? Copping, collecting, and so much more. New episodes drop every Wednesday. Hit the links in the show notes for this episode to give our new shows a listen and be on the lookout for more new podcasts dropping soon. Last but not least, tell someone you like their kicks today. You never know how far a simple compliment can take you, and we all know how good it feels to have someone show their appreciation. Thank you all for the support, and we'll catch you on the next episode. Peace.